Okay, good afternoon everyone. My name is Dave Rissick. I'm Deputy Director of NCAF and welcome to um, our webinar training session on Coast Adapt. Apologies first of all for those of you who joined us yesterday where we had a bit of a technical hitch but hopefully all is working today and um, we look forward to presenting to you over the next hour or so. This afternoon we'll talk about four things relating to Coast Adapt. Firstly, I'll give you an overview of Coast Adapt itself, what's in it and why. Then Fahim will talk about um, risk assessment, something that's really important when you're starting to do your adaptation planning. And then Anne will talk about something that's equally important in adaptation planning, and that is the communication and engagement. And then finally, I will talk you through the steps in our um, coastal climate change adaptation decision support um, process so that you're able to understand what you should be doing when you're developing your adaptation plans. So when we view climate change on the coast, we often see um, images such as this on the news and we see swimming pools that we saw last year down in Coleroy in Sydney or erosion on beaches. But climate change on the coast is more than just beach erosion. We also have a whole lot of other issues that can arise with, um, with climate change, such as flooding on estuaries, um, heat waves, and all the damage that that can cause to people, but also to infrastructure, and importantly, bushfire, something we do have to manage on the coast as well as other areas in Australia. And when we're managing for climate change, we need to think about all of these because we might make a good decision for one thing, which could be a bad decision for others. And hopefully what we provide in Coast Adapt can help you to deal with this issue. The coastal zone, therefore, we've taken a fairly broad um, approach to that in, in what we consider in Coast Adapt. Um, we think of it as a social, economic and ecological system, in including beaches, including estuaries, including those settlements around it, and even the bush, the natural ecosystems and, and, and agricultural areas um, in, along estuaries and even slightly upstream. So we believe there's something in Coast Adapt for everyone, whether you are directly on the coast or whether you live in the catchment. So the basis of Coast Adapt when we started off was to consider firstly a demand-driven approach. We didn't want to come out with, a, with an approach that we developed up in-house and then took out to stakeholders. We went out and we spent about six months talking to stakeholders, finding out what they wanted, what they needed, and how they wanted that information delivered to them. We also had to deliver something that was authoritative. So we worked with the best experts around Australia and beyond to develop a lot of the content that we have in Coast Adapt. And also everything that we, that we include in Coast Adapt has been reviewed by, by um, academic or expert peers, but also by end users. So we know that it's authoritative and we also know that people are able to use it and make sense of it, which is really important. Importantly from an Australian perspective is that the work we produce aligns with the states and territories. And so we've worked very closely with the states and territories throughout the production of Coast Adapt so that they are comfortable with what we're delivering and people in each state and territory can go out and use it knowing full well that it aligns with what is required by your <coughs> particular government in that state. And we also have um, particular pages in Coast Adapt that provide information from those states and territories that users should be aware of. So look out for those when you're working with the tool. Finally, we needed to have multiple entry points because we do recognise that people are using Coast Adapt from different um, areas. So a lot of you have, might have been planning on uh, climate change adaptation for a long time, while others might not even have started. And we wanted to make sure that people can use it at whatever stage of planning they were in, starting from scratch or using it to assess what you've done before. So what's in Coast Adapt? For those of you who haven't seen it before, um, this is what the front page looks like and you can immediately see there's a lot of information there. So um, things I wanted to point out on this particular page were that we provide a series of, of information that you can download and use to help you do your own work or to help you communicate with others. So if you look at the bottom left hand side you'll see there's a, a page there for infographics and there you can access single page documents that provide quite a lot of information that you can use in a simple way to provide to your stakeholders or even internal stakeholders in your organisation. An important function that I wanted to point out at this stage is our Getting Started button, which is there with the green spade. And that we've provided a bunch of questions that people might be interested in that can help direct you to areas of Coast Adapt where you might want to get started. 
and also we've done this for a number of different sectors and professions so that if you're a, um, a planner for instance or if you're in an NRM group you can get guidance on where you could start to use Coast Adapt information and some of the other information that you can access through Coast Adapt I'll talk through now. So there's over 200 pieces of content within Coast Adapt. There's a lot of information and we certainly won't have time to get through everything today. So we do encourage you to access Coast Adapt and use it in your own time. There's a lot to learn and a lot of really interesting information in there. We've taken an approach that we've called the skimmer, wader, diver approach to delivering information through Coast Adapt. So the skimmer um, content is a one-line statement that really gives an indication of what's contained in that particular piece of content. The wader is a section with five or six dot points that provides a good overview of what's in that section and gives a little bit more detail and it's probably what we see that most users would use. And of course in most organizations there's a need for some people to go into deeper, area, um, deeper diving and we have the diver content and that is where we put a lot more information, a lot more detail and also lists of references where you can learn more. So what else is in Coast Adapt? <clears throat> we, have, we provide quite a lot of data. We've got two data and visualization products. The first being Sea Level Rise and U. Sea Level Rise and U enables you to go into every local government around Australia and access sea level rise projections that were developed by CSIRO um, for that particular local government area. Um, there's also, importantly, guidance on how to use this information. Um, and that is something we've really strived to do with some of the data and the information we provide because it is quite difficult for many stakeholders to make sense of it. The sea level rise projections you see there include different climate change scenarios and you can go there and see what the sea level rise might be under high emissions if we continue as, uh, um, to um, uh, emit greenhouse gases as we are at present through to what happens if we might get it under control. And, uh, and later on you'll find some guidance about how to make sense of this when you're doing your risk assessments. Importantly, we provide an, um, some mapping to show how the sea level rise data look on land where there is LIDAR data available in Australia. So there you're able to go into your local government area or the area of your interest and see under different climate change scenarios how that um, sea level rise might look once bathtub approach happens or it starts to fill up. And that gives you, is really useful when you're doing your first pass risk assessments and trying to determine the extent of where water might be under different sea level rise scenarios in the future. The next data set we provide is um, our Shoreline Explorer and there we provide a number of different data sets. We have a, a new um, area that is interesting for Australia called sediment compartments and here the, the Australian coastline has been divided up into over 300 different secondary sediment compartments and we've worked with experts to pull out information about how the sediment behaves in each of those compartments and you can get some information on that from within Coast Adapt and, uh, and then follow a link to quite detailed information in some places and others where there's less available because we are using the best available information that's, that's available at present. We also have SmartLine which is delivered through Geosciences Australia and that is a visualisation tool that identifies coastal areas that are susceptible to erosion. So there's a line that you'll find around the Australian coastline and you can click on that line and it will show you how the level of erodibility that is um, at that particular point. We also have Smart Line Advanced if you're interested in what the types of sediment are and why that erodibility is there and you can go in and learn a lot more about that particular um, area of shoreline. The other uh, data set we provide here is called Water Observations from Space, another data set that we've gained through Geosciences Australia and this data set is um, derived from satellites that circle around Australia taking images each time and when there's no cloud around and they're able to photograph the, the water on land it will identify where there's permanent water bodies which generally comes out in the darker blue or where there might be water occasionally which indicates an area that might be susceptible to flooding. Again something that's really useful when you're thinking about the scale and extent of your, your um, flooding or, or potential or planning that you might be doing. So the web content that we have in Coast Adapt is, is a lot of it as I said before 
and we provide information about a lot of different things, <coughs> ranging from how to access climate change scenarios, and I'm not going to list them all here, but just showing you that there are a range of really important bits of information that can help you with your adaptation planning um, and, and with adaptation action later on. Um, and a lot of these include important things that to our stakeholders, such as reducing the risk of le legal challenge and working with consultants. So there's 84 pages of this sort of content, all with the skimmer, wader, diver approach that I talked about earlier. We provide quite a lot of guidance documents and checklists that can help you to do activities associated with your adaptation planning and can help you to assess um, whether you are doing things um, according to good practice or not. We also have some simple tools that can help you to go through and actually undertake certain things, such as your first, second or third pass risk assessments. Our stakeholders wanted a lot of information about what other people were doing in climate change adaptation. And we've collated quite a range of different case studies and snapshots around adaptation in Australia and beyond. So um, these are provided as often two-page documents or six-page documents and even videos. And it's a really great resource when you're trying to get buy-in from your own organisations because what we find is people are more likely to act if they know that others have tried and done things successfully as well, and also to learn from other people's mistakes. The last bit that I'm going to talk about at what's in Coast Adapt is our Coastal Climate Adaptation Decision Support Tool, CCADS, and this is to basically puts all the information that's available in Coast Adapt into a context and supports people to go through a process of decision making from starting from scratch all the way to developing an adaptation plan, implementing that plan, and then monitoring evaluation. So an important component. And we also provide here a template that people can use to keep notes and keep track of the progress that you've done, as well as, as allowing you to, to keep track of this in the actual website itself. Because coastal planning does not be done, is not done overnight. It takes a while. And in many cases, it's likely that the person who starts off the planning won't be the person who finishes it. And so this is a way of keeping that documentation going and make, making sure that you don't have to start again from scratch later on. So when we look at, at Coast Adapt and Coastal Adaptation Planning, we find you can provide information and guidance products. You can provide sea level rise and, and, and information um, data. And you can provide a decision support framework, which we have in Coast Adapt. But unless you have a whole lot of other things that take place as well, it's unlikely that you'll be adapting successfully. And so these are things such as leadership, governance, communication and engagement, knowledge broking, building skills. And we've put a lot of effort into the documentation and guidance within Coast Adapt to help this happen. And so that you can ensure that A, you can plan according to good practice, but you can also ensure that all these other things take place that is more likely to lead to successful outcomes from your plan. So just a reminder of where you can access Coast Adapt, www.coastadapt.com.au. And I'll now pass over to Fahim, who will talk about risk assessments. Thank you. Uh, my name is Fahim Tonmoy. I'm, I'm the Coastal Zone Specialist here at NCARF. And uh, today in, in this session, I'll talk about uh, the climate change risk assessment process in uh, Coast Adapt. While doing that, I'll uh, try to show you how different uh, data sets, uh, guidance, and templates that are available through Coast Adapt can be used in uh, this process. Let me uh, first uh, start by uh, showing you how we laid out the uh, risk assessment process in Coast Adapt. So we have three levels of risk assessment. Uh, fast pass risk screening, second pass risk assessment, and third pass uh, risk assessment. So why do we have three levels? Mainly because uh, organizations often have limited resources that they can invest in uh, climate change risk assessment type of work. That's why we created a, a low cost uh, fast pass risk screening that uses existing national and state level information and can provide users a high level information about their uh, future climate change risk. It can help them to identify uh, assets and geographical areas that might be at risk in future. And more importantly, it can help identify stakeholders that uh, can be, that they need to engage with down the track in the second pass risk assessment. 
So, uh, so once you identified uh, the relevant stakeholders through fast pass risk screening, second pass risk assessment is about getting those stakeholders in a room and conducting a risk workshop. While you uh, identify specific risk and then you go through uh, the likelihood and consequence of each risk and come up with a risk register. And the risk register will essentially tell you that some of the risks are <clears throat> more important for you and some of them are not so much. And as you identified any critical risk through second pass risk assessment, third pass assessment is about narrowing down to that particular risk to at a site specific level and then engage with a consultant to commission hazard studies so that a consultant can build some biophysical models and can tell you more detail about the rate and appropriate uh, approximate time in future of future changes so that you can start thinking about thresholds and, uh, and, and triggers and that can you ultimately use for planning your uh, adaptation actions down the track. And in, in COSTADAP, we have a section uh, called risk assessment, and that gives you access to a, a different uh, detailed guidelines for all, for all these different levels of risk assessment. This also provides you other information like available templates, tools, and data that you can use in this purpose. It also provides you a, a, a useful guide which can help you to identify which uh, map you can use, which, what, what, what is the appropriate map to use in a particular type of risk assessment. So that's uh, about the overview of uh, risk uh, assessment process in Costed Up. Now today we won't ha have time to go through all the three levels of risk assessment. I'll just give you an overview of fast pass risk screening and uh, we'll give a quick uh, summary of a second pass towards the end. So in fast pass risk screening, as you can see, the, the four steps are, are uh, these are the four fundamental steps of fast pass screening, which are quite similar to ISO 31000 uh, risk management process. These are step one, you scope your assessment. In step two, you identify your existing risk. In step three, you identify your future climate change related risk. And in step four, you evaluate those risks and uh, come up with a strategy. So in, while doing in step one, it's all about framing it, it's, uh, identifying the object, objective, identifying your scale. Do you want to do it for your whole council or your part of your council? for your whole business or part of your business. You need to decide what sort of time frame you want to investigate in future. And you also need to uh, decide what climate change scenario you want to investigate uh, in, in future. And the selection of time frame and climate change scenarios can often be interrelated. As an example, uh, if you think about time frame, if you're doing a risk assessment for a transport infrastructure or dam or a bridge, then your planning horizon more likely to be more than over 50 years. On the other hand, if you're doing a risk assessment for a tourism business, this time frame more likely to be quite smaller, like 10 to 15 or 20 years. <clears throat> so the selection of time frame depends on what systems you are actually looking at. And your selection of climate change scenarios can be guided by a number of things. <clears throat> First, your state's uh, preference. Your state can give you a benchmark that you have to follow, specifically for sea level rise. The second thing is uh, your time frame that you have chosen. If you have chosen a time frame uh, which is within the next 10 to 15 years, then you can see that there's not much difference between red and blue, blue, blue line, which are the higher and lower emission scenarios. So you can easily select high emission scenarios if your time frame is quite short. But if your time frame is uh, beyond 2050, then you can see the uh, emission scenarios start to diverge and you can probably want to uh, investigate uh, multiple scenarios, a high emission or a moderate emission scenarios. Third driving factor for uh, scenario selection is the criticality of your system. If your system is highly critical, you want to investigate a high emission scenario because you want to identify the worst case uh, uh, possible situations. And in Coast we have a section called Future Climate Data, which provides a range of information about uh, climate change scenarios, their access, use, and interpretation. So that's a very good source of information. So in step one, you have identified your uh, objective scale and you have selected what time frame and scenario you want to use in your assessment. So in second step, it's about identifying your existing climate-related risk. So is it essentially uh, working with uh, local knowledge, people who have local knowledge and expert no uh, local expertise, and basically try to find out what sort of uh, previous hazards has happened in your area in the past. You might find 
that you there are certain areas in your council that are already erosion prone or you might have some areas that are already uh, uh, getting inundated during high tides and if you don't have any risk management strategy uh, for uh, tackling those existing for example erosion or uh, inundation related issues that means there is a uh, existing residual risk in your system regardless of climate change and as i mentioned uh, the, the most important uh, uh, data that you can use in this step is local knowledge and talking to uh, local experts and another data product from coasted up uh, which is water observation from space can be used as well it's, that can provide you a uh, um, help you to identify areas that has been far flooded in the uh, past so in as you in step 2 we have identified your existing reefs now step 3 is about identifying your future climate change related risk and opportunities so if i give an example let's say you have identified uh, in step 1 you have decided that you want to investigate high emission scenario at 2050 and in step two, you have identified that you have some areas that already been uh, getting flooded during high tide. So in step three, you would want to investigate an inundation map of 2050 of high emission scenario, and we would want to identify areas that might be at risk in future. And you can do the same thing for other different types of hazards like uh, uh, heat waves or erosion uh, to identify any future at risk uh, areas or assets. And there are a number of data sets that you can use from Coasted Up for this purpose, like uh, uh, sea level rise uh, projections for each coastal councils, inundation maps for each coastal councils, and again, uh, uh, temperature and uh, rainfall extreme projections. This is also available for uh, each coastal council in Australia. There are certain data sets, national data sets, that are sitting outside Coasted Up like Coast Climate Risk Australia, you can use those sort of data set in this particular step and we can get access to them from uh, this page of course. We also invited each step to have their own state specific page where they can list their state specific data sets and uh, guidelines and policies. So you can check out your state specific page as well to find out any uh, state specific data that might be useful in this uh, particular st step three of risk assessment. So once you identified our existing and future risk, step four is about just evaluating those risks, identifying which risk matters most to you and which not so much. And the outcome of that particular uh, whole exercise can be a list of geographical areas or a list of infrastructures that you think that might be at risk in future. And more importantly, a list of stakeholders that uh, come out of this exercise that you need to get engaged with down the track to make your adaptation progress uh, further. There are an, uh, four uh, templates in Coasted Up that can be used for risk assessment purpose. And these four different templates has uh, different purpose and different levels of complexity. And each of the templates have a readme section that you can uh, read and, uh, and that will tell you when to use a particular template and what to do in, uh, while doing that. So that's all about fast pass risk screening in a very quick summary. I want to give you a very uh, quick overview of a second pass uh, risk assessment, just to give you a head start. So, so in, in fast pass assessment, you have identified a number of assets and geographical areas and sectors that you think might be at risk in future, and you have also identified a range of stakeholders that you need to get engaged with. Now in second pass assessment, you have to get those stakeholders in a room to conduct a risk workshop and follow the second pass. Uh, process and the, and the steps are exactly same as the fast pass risk screening as you can see but the things that you do inside this step are quite different as an example in step one where you're scoping this uh, second pass assessment yeah. your scope has to be narrower as an example you might have found out that tourism and roads are the two sectors that might be at risk in future through your fast pass assessment second pass assessment should focus only on those two uh, narrowed down uh, sectors and step two and three, where you identified your existing and future risk, are uh, uh, again different in second pass assessment. In fast pass assessment, both these steps were kind of binary, where you identified yes or no, whether you had a past event, whether you will have a future risk or not. But in second pass assessment, it's more about uh, a, doing a qualitative assessment 
it's more you 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 try to identify the whether the impact was moderate or insignificant or it will have a significant impact specifically step 3 is quite crucial because in that particular step you go through likelihood and consequence of each individual risk and discussing consequence with your stakeholders in a risk workshop is very important and critical because in while doing discussing consequences you will discuss about different interdependency among different risk interdependency between different business processes and infrastructures as well as you will also discuss about uh, adaptive capacity of particular systems so that you can think about uh, how your system might uh, might uh, might might be capable of adapting to a particular hazard and step four is about uh, evaluating those identified risks uh, against certain uh, evaluation criteria. And we often found that this particular step risk evaluation has been uh, performed badly by uh, mo uh, most of the organizations. It's mainly because when you are doing a risk evaluation, uh, those criteria should focus on issues and aspects that are important for the organizations such as their corporate objectives. If uh, climate change risks are evaluated against a new set of criteria rather than organizations existing uh, uh, cri uh, risk evaluation criteria, then it's difficult. Uh, it becomes challenging to mainstream the identified risk within organizations' business process. So the advice is stay uh, as close as possible to your existing uh, organizational uh, risk criteria, terminologies, and scales rather than adopting something new. So, so that's uh, the overview of a quick overview of a second pass assessment. I haven't showed you any uh, examples, so but we do have some examples. We have uh, commissioned uh, uh, some uh, projects with uh, a number of uh, organizations in Australia who have used cost up data and uh, guidelines to do a different types of risk assessment. So please do look out for those uh, uh, reports. Those are available from our case study sections and uh, they are a good source of information about getting a hands-on uh, example of doing the risk assessment. And uh, that's all from my end. Uh, so, so far I have showed how to conduct and identify uh, different climate change risk. Now in the next session Anne will tell you how to communicate those identified risks to your relevant stakeholders. Over to Anne. Hi, my name's Anne Leach and I'm with NCARF and today I'm talking about communication and engagement. Now, if you're watching this, you've probably already identified that, um, that communi communication and engagement in coastal adaptation is not easy. Um, and one way to think about this is thinking about sea level rise as a wicked problem. Now, we're increasingly dealing with wicked problems such as obesity, globalisation, drugs, you know, lots of, lots of examples of wicked problems in society today. And one, well, there's several, several common features around these. <clears throat> First of all, there's many stakeholders involved. And each stakeholder will have a different idea about what the problem is, what its cause, and any p potential solutions. Another feature is that although these problems are similar in different places, or similar, you know, you might have dealt with this problem in the, in the past, each problem is unique. So although you can learn from past dealings with problems, um, you're going to have to find a new effort for each context. There's also no ideal solution. Uh, any solution is going to be a compromise and you know you can you can guarantee that no one not everyone's going to be happy with the solution. In fact, it's probably likely that not many people are going to be happy with potential solutions. And also as soon as you start trying to deal with the problem, it adapts and changes. So any attempt to resolve the problem is going to is going to poke it in some different direction and it will it will you know, morph and change. So all this adds up to quite a difficult problem to actually deal with. But one thing we do know about wicked problems is that they need effective engagement. So in the past, a lot of ways that we dealt with problems and how to communicate them was at the beginning we'd identify the stakeholders that needed to be involved, look at what the, how they like to be involved, key messages, and kind of develop a communication plan that would go for the life of the project. Now, anyone that's tried to do this with a wicked problem rapidly finds out that that doesn't work. And it's not surprising because as you move through the project problem 
so, you know, resolution part, you find that your communication needs to change, your stakeholders change, and what you're trying to do um, changes quite dramatically as well. So we find that with wicked problems such as coping with coastal ad adaptation needs effective engagement process that are more creative and um, that are more resource intensive as well. So if you think about them as trying to facilitate a continued dialogue, collaboration and exchange of ideas. We'll talk a bit more about that. So in working with wicked problems, um, you Need, you, your bottom line is that these processes should seek to build trust. And if you use that as your touchstone with this process, and each process comes back to how do we build trust with these, with, with what we're about to, with what we're trying to do. So in developing the resources for Coast Adapt, um, we developed an information manual. I'll talk, talk a bit more about that in a minute. But basically, through the process of developing that uh, communication manual, we came up with a set of principles around effective engagement for adaptation. And these are firstly that engagement takes time. Um, it's resource intensive, and one of those resources is the time that you're going to need to spend. Um, it also changes over time. So what you do at the beginning of the process will, will change a lot from what you were doing at the, towards, towards the end of the process. So it's, it's different at each step through the process. It, importantly, it needs to consider and include a target audience as well as those that influence the target audience. And how this plays out in coastal areas is that it's very tempting to just work with the people that are directly affected by coastal change. So some communities, this is added up to the people whose houses are directly affected by coastal erosion are the ones that tend to lead the process and get involved with the process. Whereas other ratepayers who sit further back from the beach or who perhaps are users of the beach rather than kind of directly on the beach, they can often get left out of the process. So it's very important to think about your target audience as quite a, quite a diverse group across the, across the shire. And therefore, it needs, effective engagement needs to be inclusive and value the diversity and also the, the changes within the community as well. So how's your community going to change now and into the future? Effective communication needs to be clearly scoped and well resourced. And you need to think carefully about how you're going to involve the community and how any involvement they have will be used. You know, how will you use their input to, to affect um, what you do? It's also really important that effective engagement is monitored and evaluated through an adaptive process. So we actually look at what you're doing and monitor as you go how it's going to be effective. As well, you need to think about the different groups in your community and do you need to build the capacity of those groups to be involved. So obviously there are some powerful groups in the community that find it easy to get involved, but there are other groups that may be hard to reach or hard to engage and they might need some capacity building to ensure that they're able to participate in the process. So in some pro projects that I've worked in that has involved maybe running leadership courses for um, less powerful groups or helping some of these groups set up um, a newsletter for their constituents or helping them to engage in some way so that they can, they can, have, um, they can have a say in these processes as well. So as you work through Coast Adapt um, and work through the CCADS process, you'll find that each step of CCADS requires different types of, of communication engagement. And for, for example, in the risk assessment process, some of the early steps might involve uh, different community groups that have good local knowledge that you can bring into that risk assessment process. Whereas you know, some of the later steps, you might be trying to engage you know, more broadly across a, a wide diversity of the, the community. But basically what you need to think through at each step is who are the stakeholders? You need to identify the key groups, leaders, existing networks that are important for each step. And you need to work out how you're going to prioritise these stakeholders because you can't deal with everybody. So how are you going to involve these projects, these stakeholders, without actually overwhelming yourself and your organisation too? You need to think how will you reach them and how will you get them involved? But it's also important not to leave out your own organisation. How are you going, who are the stakeholders within your organisation that need to, need to be involved in the process and how are you going to involve the, those? And sometimes actually going through the act of planning communication within your organisation can actually be a really good way of involving them in the process too and getting your own, the, the local knowledge of your own organisation involved in the process as well. 
Yeah. So a good way, a good place to start in thinking about communication in Coast Adapt is looking at the information number nine on communication and engagement. So when we were writing this manual, we uh, and we already knew that there's a lot of resources out there on communication and engagement in different contexts. Uh, there's lots of lots of descriptions of toolkits and resources and how to's and things. So we didn't want to we didn't want to replicate those. So the information manual talk, takes a broad conversational approach in how to approach engagement, how to think about it, and it also lists a lot of resources at the back that we found that, that are really quite useful. For example, each state has, in each, well most state governments have a communication and engagement toolkit or guidelines or something, and that's a really good place to start for your, for your situation as well as it outlines some things that are relevant to your context. So have a look at the have a look at your state um, resources too. The other thing that we talk about a bit in the information manual is some of the theory behind communication engagement because we found it people find it really helpful if they kind of have a bit of a structure to approach engagement by. And one of the ones that we describe in the toolkit in the information manual is the IAP2 framework because that's already used by a lot of councils. So the IAP2 framework is developed by the International Association for Public Participation and it's useful because it's got a lot of resources that sit behind it. They have conferences and lots of kind of written resources and, and you know, events that you can go to as well that are quite useful. Also, because the IAP2 framework is used a lot by councils, it gives you a common language for talking to your, to your peers in, in other councils as well. So just a bit about the IAP2 framework. So this is useful because it articulates nicely different levels of participation, starting from inform, which is telling people about what you're doing, through to consulting them, starting to involve them and get their ideas in, through to um, involving, collaborate and empower. So empower is quite a lofty goal and some councils, because that's a very much um, where the council or your organisation hands over some of the decision making power, and most organisations find that's a bit too much um, and some councils have described empowerment occurs through the, through the ballot box, through, so through the process of getting elected. So most councils concentrate on the inform, consult, involve and collaborate steps of the IOP2 framework. So if you have a look through these and you can work out which level, you're, which level you want to use at different steps in, the, in CCADS, and you can start to also have a look at potential techniques that fit into those, those different um, phases of, of in engagement as well. So for example, at the bottom of this table, you can see there's a list of potential techniques that are, that are quite commonly used with those different steps. However, it really comes back to how you implement those steps that determines on, on where they ultimately fit. For example, developing a fact sheet, that's usually very one way. So you develop a fact sheet about, about, a, particular, about a particular aspect that you want to tell the community about. So that's kind of an inform strategy. However, if you have a community group that develops that fact sheet, so it's actually coming from the community then that moves that, moves that fact sheet along to a higher, higher level of engagement. So therefore it depends how you think about and how you actually implement those different steps. But it's quite useful in thinking about how you're going to actually start doing your, um, your communication and engagement. So in planning your engagement, it's really important that you understand your stakeholders. And two questions to have at the back of your mind here is, what do they already know and what do we already know about them? So therefore, in planning, your, planning at each step, you need to think about what are their perceptions of the issue and what are their concerns going to be about the issue? And what can they, what can they get wrong about this issue? What, what's a common misunderstanding about this issue as well? Because that helps you get on the front foot. You need to think about how they can be consulted and engaged. What are really useful ways that they already they're already using to to um, get involved in these sorts of processes? And another thing is, what are your perceptions and concerns about um, about these different groups? And it's really useful to talk to others in your organisation because different parts of the organisation will have different perceptions and concerns about dealing with these groups, probably from um, a history of dealing with them or even a history of not dealing with them as well. You need to think about what local knowledge these groups already hold and how are you going to track progress and change. 
The other thing you need to do is not just start with a clean slate as well. There's a whole lot of existing community groups, organisations within your, within your region, within your community that already have existing networks that you can tap into. So it's really great if you can um, not just set up your own meetings and things, but more importantly, you know, tap into the meetings of others and, and you know, work out what the problem is going to be from their perspective and go to them and, and work with them to communicate with their constituents as well. And we talk about that a lot in the information manual is how do you involve other, other groups and, and tap into other networks. So it's quite useful to have a look through some of the resources section to get a handle on some of that techniques. Mm -hmm. For example, um, a good facilitation tool to you with you, use with your organ, own organisation is mapping your stakeholders and mapping the networks of stakeholders in your community. And um, you'll end up with something that looks a bit like this on your screen. Um, we call that a horrendogram because it just it's just too much to deal with. So, but it does help you think through quite a lot of the groups that you're going to need to deal with and it just kind of helps well scare you into into working out what you have to what you have to do to involve this um, number of, of people so then another another uh, another tool that you can use is start to prioritize them and prioritize all these different groups and there's many different ways to do this as well but one useful one on the screen to start off with is you know by stake by prioritizing stakeholders you want to help decide who and when you're going to include and this grid on the screen looks at who has an interest in the outcome and who has the power to influence the outcome and just going through this process helps you identify different groups that are going to be already interested um, and involved and those groups that probably have low interest but might need to be involved and they the that sort of bottom left hand square of the grid is can be quite challenging but it shouldn't be empty because there should be people who have low interest um, currently but m their interests are going to change into the future and they're probably groups that have low power to influence but that doesn't mean that they should be left out so working through this um, and the example i've got there is for a school that might be located in the coastal zone um, and you and just sort of thinking about uh, starting to think about different groups that might be involved in in thinking about how coastal adaptation is going to be required for that school location. Now, as um, we mentioned before, quite often the person starting off the, the adaptation planning in, isn't necessarily the person that finishes the adaptation planning because um, there can be staff turnover or, or pr the project might change. So it's very useful to keep records on your interactions with different groups in the community as you go. And again, in the resource kits, there's many different ways to do this. This is just one on the screen now, um, which lists a few um, things that you might want to track progress and change with, with your stakeholder groups. Um, and so this helps you just keep a record because one of the worst things you can do with the community, and particularly in some of the smaller communities that you know often are experiencing coastal erosion, is a new person comes in and goes back as though there has been no history with this community as well. So if you keep these kind of fairly detailed records, it just helps any new person to understand what has happened. So you don't keep going, you don't keep restarting these projects with the community, but you can kind of go in and with some knowledge as what has happened before, because these communities also experience quite a lot of community burnout where the same people are involved in lots of different processes. So keep records, they could be, could be really useful. So just to kind of recap, um, communication is quite difficult, expect it to be resource intensive, um, expect it to change, expect it to need to require some conflict resolution, um, some good facilitation, um, but ultimately look at it as a way to build trust with your community and if you use that as your touchstone then you'll be well on your way to you know, making a creative and effective engagement processes for your coastal adaptation. Thanks. Thanks, Anne. Um, before we go into talking about preparing your plan, I did want to remind you that you are able to submit questions. There will be time for a Q&A session later on. So um, I think on the bottom right-hand side of your screen, you'll see a, a place where you can type in a question, and we'll do our best to answer those later on. Now, I'm taking on the challenging task of 
talking about preparing an adaptation plan in 15 minutes. Um, but um, then there is a lot of detailed guidance in Coast Adapt about preparing a plan. You need to read that material. I won't have time to go through it all now. So I'll try and draw out some of the things that are important. Right from the front, having good framing for your adaptation plan, very clear objectives and a vision are essential components. We'll talk a bit about that in step one, um, but they are really important and they really help you to work out who should be involved both internally and externally in your organisations or beyond, the scale at which you should be um, dealing with the issue and the role of the plan right from the word go, whether it's a strategic plan, whether it's an operational plan, or even in some cases, whether it's a specific project that you're undertaking. You can get guidance for all of those through this framework of CCADS. Um, and the important thing I wanted to draw out earlier on, and again I'll reiterate it, is leadership and support within your organisation are crucial to getting your adaptation plan through effectively. So this is the CCADS framework. Um, it's a risk-based framework, something that most people who've done any form of coastal zone management and looked at the guidance that comes from state governments and looked at good practice from beyond Australia will be familiar with. It goes through a series of six steps in this case. Some of these frameworks have eight steps, some four. It doesn't matter how many steps there are. What's important is stepping through the process. And as I um, will reiterate again, you can go and enter this process at the stage you are at in your own planning. We're not saying start again from scratch. We recommend trying to assess your existing plans that you might have and build on them where possible. And in some cases, you may well need to start again. The thing I also want you to notice here is the number of opportunities you have to change and learn from what you've done and start again or make um, slight differences right from at each step. So we don't um, say go through the whole cycle and then start again. In some cases, you might go to the next step and decide that you need to change your direction again and it allows you to go to the front and start from, from, from the beginning again. When you're using CCADS, we take what we call a scan, plan and delve deeper approach. The scan is really familiarising yourself with what's in the whole of the CCADS framework. If you just go to step one and start doing it, you might waste some time and you might um, not know where you're going to next. So it's quite useful, even if you're using the, the, the sort of, um, I guess, wader content, the dot points at the top, to familiar, familiarise yourself with what you need in each section, it's quite important. The planning cycle is when you go through and you actually start to work through the CCADS framework and you, you're building up your adaptation plan. And the delve deeper component is really for those people who have identified a specific challenge that they've done, they they've go into a much deeper risk assessment approach and they then need to do some more detailed engineering or social work to get something happening. Um, and those are the, th <coughs> excuse me, the three levels. CCADS should never just be done once. It's intended to be used and reiterate over time. A number of different cycles that allow you to learn from what you've done before. The important thing here is learning from what you've done before. Adaptation is new, it's complex, it's difficult, and changes will need to be made. We need to set up processes that we learn from what we've done and build on that as we go forward. So, step one of CCADS, identifying challenges. I like to call this step really setting yourself up for success because at this stage you're determining the scope, the framing for your planning. I said it before, that's important, it is. It may be that you are, your particular area is affected by a large amount of sea level rise, inundation or potentially affected by it. It may have flooding that encro um, encroaches onto areas beyond your actual control. So right from the word go, you need to be thinking about if that is the case, who do you deal with? Is a plan for your one council enough? Should you be having a plan that, co that, that covers a number of councils, a number of organisations? If your plan is only for your council but the issue is beyond, how do you set that up right from the word go that you engage effectively with your stakeholders beyond your area of remit so you get something useful happening? At this stage, it's also very important to identify the barriers that are there to your planning. There's are generally going to be internal and perhaps some of your stakeholders um, are, are challenges. But identifying those barriers early on allows you to really set yourself up again for success because you can think about how you get over those barriers. 
Of course, you're going to set a vision and goals that are important for what you, you want to achieve from this process. And you then can start to understand the climate threats and opportunities that arise. And I do want to emphasize that opportunities because we often think about threats, which is a problem because it's negative discourse that we have with our communities and so on. If we can identify opportunities and ways in which we can benefit or make the most of our challenges and build on what we've got, that's important. Then it's important to undertake your first pass risk screening. And based on the outcomes of that, you can start to use that information to get buy-in to act. Now this buy-in is critical within your organization. Often the first steps are done by someone who's not high up in an organization. And to get that buy-in, they need to work up through their own organization and get the support that's required right from the outset. And that's where that leadership that, again, I emphasized earlier on is important, whether it's from the, the person that's highest up in the organization or senior management. But that leadership is really important and helps to drive your adaptation planning through effectively. You can also get that buy-in or social license, you might call it, from your external so stakeholders. And then you need to set up processes to actually undertake your planning. And this means establishing the roles that you have for adaptation within the organization. Who's going to develop the plan? Who's responsible for this? What sort of governance do you need to set up? And we provide some guidance and some indication of that within um, and, and how to do it within um, the CCADS framework and the rest of Coast Adapt. The next step is undertaking your risk assessments and determine the vulnerability that you face from climate change. This gives you that opportunity to really start to refine your priority interest, areas of interest. So you've done your first pass risk assessments, you know vaguely now where the challenges are going to be and you can really refine your, your, where you're going to put your effort into doing your second pass risk assessments. You then can undertake those second pass risk assessments and develop a, develop a risk register for your organisation or your area of interest. At this stage, you can even start to think about some of the priorities and the way that, and the timing that might be required for a response. If you have identified that you have, that your particular area has got no real challenges from climate change in the near future, you can really identify those now and start to make sense of it. And again, you then do stakeholder engagement communication based on what you've learned at this particular stage. Lots of inf information within CCADS and within the rest of Coast Adapt to help you work through this particular phase. Step three is when we start to think about what we're going to do about these risks. And we need to identify the options that are available to us. Now you can use a number of different ways of, of, of sourcing adaptation options. Some of these will fall directly out from your risk tables that you've identified. You can almost visualize what you need to do to get over a certain challenge. I think a very important um, I issue at this stage is working with your stakeholders to think about what they think is required to deal with the issue. They are the people who are going to be affected by it. It's great if they can come up with the solutions. Now, even if their solutions aren't selected in the end, their involvement will make a difference. And then the fact that their, their um, ideas are thought of is often very empowering for communities and gets them to, really, to, to come up with innovative solutions. You can also build from others' ex experience. Um, so there's lots of lists of adaptation options that are becoming available. You can find those online, but within uh, Coast Adapt, we also provide a number of different um, tables with um, potential adaptation options. Um, and these can be used to identify what sorts of options might be available and then help people to, to think of other ones that might be um, uh, um, particular options for, the, for your issues that you face. You need to think about collating various bits of information about each option, the costs, how long it takes, what, um, what, what any risks might be and so on. And again, you can get um, details from that within CCADS. And you can start to think about some of the things um, that you have, like win-win situations, those sort of options that provide you immediate benefits versus those that are going to be um, more reactive to bigger climate change effects when they occur later on. And even thinking about some of the real challenging things for your communities, those transformational options 
that, that really are difficult, that mean very big changes to what they've got at the moment. An example of that might be relocating a community from some place where they've lived for a long, long time before. That is really, really challenging. And um, we need to think about those sort of um, steps early on because we need to recognize just how difficult they are to implement and how we need to get people involved for long periods of time before we do those. Of course, at this stage, we might have learned a whole lot of things and it might be necessary to go back to step one and think about reframing and passing through again and never forget those arrows that are in the, um, the CCAS framework. Step four is when we start to evaluate those options and start preparing a plan. So we need to, at this stage, establish the criteria that we're going to use to support our decision making. And that means identifying what level of risk is acceptable to our organisation, our communities and so on. And use those to start to, to stream out the, the adaptation options that we've identified. We can do some initial screening of options and we provide a number of, of questions to help you do that within the CCADS framework. Um, and then we, you need to start assessing the options you've identified. We have an information manual within Coast Adapt that provides some really great information about various tools that you can use to help you do this, such as multiple criteria analysis, cost-benefit analysis, and so on. It's important at this stage to really start thinking about how you can actually set up a sequence of solutions or an adaptation pathways, and thinking about when the timing of actions, what's required to before, to, to actually be done before you can implement an action, so those lead times. So you can think about when things can be done. I'll talk about this a bit in a, in a, in a second in a, great, in a bit more detail. And you can then start to develop your adaptation plans or your investment decisions and again be prepared to move back to other steps as required. Um, importantly at this stage of your planning too, as you start to develop a plan, you need to think about your indicators. Indicators that might be thresholds of when you should act, but indicators that, can, that you might use to look at the success or not of your adaptation options. And those will be very important when you go to the monitoring and evaluation phase, but should be incorporated in an adaptation plan. And you should also be thinking about how you can get your adaptation plan to be mainstreamed or to really become a driver within your organisation. And rather than sitting as a plan outside of everything else in your organisation, that it integrates everything that's going on because that way you can really drive things forward. So there's a lot of detail about adaptation planning that we haven't got time to go in now. What should be in a plan? It's important to think about integrated solutions. So those sort of solutions that can give multiple benefits to what you um, are trying to achieve from your adaptation plans. And often these will be the ones that are looked at favourably by your decision makers. So an example is if you um, have storm surge challenges, you might plant mangroves because there's some really good information showing that mangroves can da dampen storm surge and really get um, some benefits that are natural as well without having to build a wall or do some things that are engineering intensive. Um, Mangroves are important bird habitat, fish habitat, crab habitat, so they're important for biodiversity and they're also important for fish. So there might be an NRM plan or a fisheries management action that's, that, that, that's developed um, from doing this particular adaptation option. And the other thing is that more and more science is showing us that mangrove systems have, are very good at accumulating carbon and, um, and supporting that accumulation of carbon, so there's an emission reduction benefit. So you can see that with one particular set of actions, you can get a lot of outcomes, which is really important when you're starting to sell your ideas to people who want to put money into them. I talked briefly about adaptation pathways before. Um, this is really around sequencing your actions. So really deriving a map. Once you've identified all your options and you start to work out what you should do first, what might be the most cost-effective um, option that has win-win outcomes right away, versus those that are more harder and challenging and perhaps more difficult that later on. And you might want to wait until you're really sure about what the effects of climate change are before you implement those options. Waiting for longer in some of these ways also allows for new innovative solutions to pop up and, um, and come up from your communities or from other people around the globe and you can incorporate those. But it does require identifying thresholds at, when you, at, at which you determine when you're going to act and monitoring those thresholds. And that is important. It does take resources, but really important and you must do it. So an example might be if you had beach erosion, 
You might prevent erosion initially by stabilizing your dunes using revegetation methods. Over time, you might need to do some beach nourishment, which is a little bit more expensive, but, but can preserve your beach into, um, for longer periods of time. Ultimately, you might need a seawall. Now, that might, you might build a, a seawall of a particular height. It will cost quite a lot of money. And um, instead of uh, building that seawall to what the sea level rise might look like in um, 2100, you might build it towards what it might look like in 2050. But it's better to build a little bit of redundancy into that system so that if it's necessary at a later stage, that seawall can be raised rather than a new one being built from scratch. And of course, you might then ultimately, if sea level rise continues and you can't protect yourself from it with a wall, it might be worth relocating at some stage. So that might be a pathway that you could determine over time for that particular issue. Importantly, if you want to achieve outcomes from your plans, you need to think about who's responsible for various things. Your plan needs to link to other plans. You need to think about what resources are required. You need to monitor and you need to be able to reflect, react to trigger points. All your actions will have risks and limitations associated with them and it's worth identifying them and keeping them in your plan, identifying them clearly in your, in your adaptation plan. You should always think about the interaction of your adaptation options with other things that you need to manage or are managing within your area. So um, there are a range of different things going on. Think about how these interact with each other and do keep an eye on the performance indicators so that you can um, assess your, 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 your um, outcomes later on. You need to build a business case then to act and we provide a template within CCADS that can help you to do an effective business case. And um, we, um, by working through that, you can get some outcomes that are required. We provide a number of different things that you can see on the screen here that will help you to get your business case through. Things such as um, business case alone won't work. You need to possibly have your business case ready in once an event occurs, it's really useful time because that will help focus your, your, your decision makers on what you're trying to achieve. Again, it requires leadership to get a, um, a business case through and um, business case which shows that staged implementation of options is a very powerful thing because the people with the finances under their control will know that you're not trying to get them to spend money unnecessarily. Um, and again, things such as um, looking for opportunities also drive your, help drive your business case forward. Step five is when you take action. And again, here we look at barriers to action and look at ways in which we can overcome them. We really need to get stakeholder and community buy-in for the actions that we're going to do. Sometimes it's easy early on, but over time, as the options become more difficult and complex, it's really important to get that stakeholder and community buy-in. We need to think about how we're going to fund or finance the adaptation options that we've identified. Um, and we have a, a report that we developed um, and some guidance around um, adaptation finance um, that can start the journey um, within um, Coast Adapt. And we've also worked with the investor group on climate change who have brought out a report um, themselves that, can, that starts to bring the, the finance community um, into this adaptation space and can help move this forward. Partnerships are important, saves money, but also helps develop outcomes. And of course, we need to take decisions and implement those actions. The final step is monitoring and evaluation. Always looked as the final step, but often some of the most important steps. You need to develop an effective program. You need to monitor those trigger points and those indicators that we identify in our plan. And we also need to think about how we determine over time, not only the outputs, have we implemented something, but what are the outcomes? What are we achieving from this over time? We need to use that information to evaluate our plans and we need to use those evaluations to report back to our stakeholders and communities. There's a range of different tools for evaluation and, and we provide some of those within the guidance in CCADS and, and in Coast Adapt. And of course, this is only the next step to what you should be doing again and that's going through the cycle again, building on what you've learned before. So just to um, clarify, Remember those feedback loops. Adaptation is not simple. We will make mistakes. Let's learn from what we do. Keep detailed records of what's going on so, and what you've done so that others can learn from what you've done and build on that. 
communicate and engage internally and externally continually and monitor, evaluate and report back to your communities. So that's the adaptation planning in a nutshell. Um, you'll need to read a lot more on, on, on Coast Adapt and work through it more slowly than what we've taken now. Good luck. But um, now we're going to have a bit of a session on questions and answers and um, Anne is going to moderate that for us and, and make sure that we've got um, questions from you guys that we can answer. Thanks for those of you that have um, either sent your questions in through the chat or emailed Marilee your questions if it's, you're not able to do so through the chat. Um, I'll just go through those in order and we'll see, we'll try and get through um, as many as we can. Um, first of all, Fahim, here's one for you. Daryl asks, where does the National Emergency Risk Assessment Guidelines, or NIRAG, sit here, particularly with regard to standardising risk criteria for working with multiple stakeholders? So maybe if you could just give us a, a bit of a um, recap on where, what the, are the National Emergency Risk Assessment Guidelines and then answer the question. Yeah, so that's a really good question. When we start uh, uh, designing a risk assessment process in Coast Adapt, we strategically decided to st not to create something new. We wanted to stay as close as possible to any existing uh, risk assessment processes, such as uh, ISO 31000 risk assessment uh, uh, principles and guidelines. And NERAG is also uh, based on ISO 31000, so we are quite well aligned with NERAG and other uh, risk assessment process. We're, we have also uh, identified at the state level uh, risk assessment and uh, adaptation guidelines and mm -hmm. Coast Adapt's guidelines are well aligned with them as well. Mm -hmm. So the overall process is uh, quite similar, well aligned, but when you look into the details that what sort of scale I should use, what sort of uh, criteria should I use for uh, risk assessment? We provide some example. We adopted some of those from different guidelines, from NERAG or from uh, some other state government guidelines. So we provide them as an example. But advice is to uh, modify them and change them and adopt them based on your circumstances. So if you have any uh, particular thing, if you're using already NERAG in your organization, uh, advice is stay, stick to that and use mm -hmm. our templates along those guidelines. To supplement. Yeah. Okay. So Dave, Mark asks, how regularly do you think adaptation plans and strategies should be reviewed? That will often depend on the scale of the plan, who's involved and um, and what where they are where people are up to. I, I think they should be reviewed fairly regularly um, and because you've identified thresholds of what uh, of when you're going to take actions but you've also got um, your own indicators of performance and hopefully your plan is being implemented. So sometimes um, your plan may not be implemented, your, your plan may be a plan that says we're not going to do anything right now and we are going to look at this again in five years time. So as many times as you can have time bound actions within your plan will help you to review that. But it's a continual thing and, um, it, and your plan should be fit for the purpose of your organisation and so if you are reporting through your, your organisation's um, structures um, you should try and get the timing of your plan so you can report regularly on this to your higher people in your organisation. It's important that, that the plan is owned throughout the organisation and through this regular reporting and review engaging with people and making subtle changes you can get that plan to live. And if your plan can live and can be accepted, then it's more likely to achieve the outcomes. Thanks, Dave. Um, this is more a procedural question from Francis. He just wants to make sure he's had connectivity problems from where he's um, listening in uh, West Africa. So yes, we will um, have all of these, uh, um, the webinar available on the, um, the Coast Adapt page or the, the NCAF page. And um, we will respond to questions by emails after the after the um, the webinar too. If you have any follow up questions, um, the Tamar NRM from Launceston Group asks, and this is one for me, dealing with maladaptive ideas from stakeholders where they impact on other sectors. Sometimes excluding the idea can mean alienating the stakeholders. Your thoughts? So often with these wicked problems, um, as I said in the beginning. 
you know, everyone's got a different understanding of the problem, different understanding about the causes, different understanding about what the what the potential solutions are, and often often these sort of solutions um, aren't going to be aren't going to be the right ones. But hopefully, the solutions that the community comes up with can fit into a broader a broader suite of solutions. But some of the ideas you're just going to have to reject outright, um, and that's always going to be difficult. Um, however, it's shown, there's a lot of research around to show that if people are included in the process, then they're able to deal with outcomes that don't necessarily suit them. So if you've got a transparent and effective engagement process, then it's easier to deal with people's ideas not being included or being outright rejected. So that's kind of a very simple answer um, that you know really doesn't do justice to kind of the complexity of what's involved. You need to ensure that you have processes that um, for dealing with conflict um, in your in your communication and engagement processes, and that re might require some expert help. But certainly going, certainly if you're trying to build trust with your community and trying to be inclusive, you can't accommodate everyone's ideas, so you're going to have to work out how you're going to deal with that, and it's, it's not simple. So, yeah, that's, that's, um, that's a start to answer that question, question um, from Tamar. So Bob asks, if we have climate risks other than just coastal related, such as fire, heat and wave, problems, can we still use Coast Adapt? Does this mean it can be useful for non-coastal councils? Yeah, look, absolutely. Um, as I, um, I think we said earlier on, it's really important that we consider all of the risks when we're doing, um, when we consider, when we're developing up our adaptation plans, because otherwise we might make a really good decision to avoid wave action, but it might be a really bad decision from a perspective of bushfire or, or, or some of the other drivers. So really important that we consider all of those. And as far as using Coast Adapt beyond the coast, we certainly believe that at least 50% of the Coast Adapt information, of the Coast Adapt tools, are useful wherever you are. It's really the, some of the, 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 the technical guidance, some of the data, and some of the case studies that are very specific to the coast. But things such as CCADs, you can use um, beyond the coast very easily, the communication guidance, the, the risk assessment guidance and a lot of other information within it is very, very useful beyond the coast. Great. John says his organisation is mostly focused on planning for the next 10 to 15 years. Why should he be thinking about longer timescales? For him or...? Both of you, either of you. Okay, well, um, because Climate change is happening, and um, while you're planning for the next 10 to 15 years, what are you planning for? If you're building something like a house, a piece of infrastructure, it's likely that they'll last for a lot longer. So we often hear people say that houses are built for 30, 40 year horizons, and yet you drive around the Australian coast, you find houses that are over 100 years old. And that's probably going to be the, the likelihood of, of how we work into the future. So it really does depend on what our issue is and, and, and how long we need to plan for. And so it doesn't mean that the actions have to be intensive. It may be that we're doing something that's got a 5 to 15 year horizon and we do a risk assessment and we find that we're not going to be affected by climate change in that particular period of time. So we, that, it allows us to continue in, on your, as biz, with business as usual. But we might put some sort of um, stage into our thought process, into our risk plan, into the way we report risk and say in 10 years time or in 5 years time we will redo our risk assessment and just make sure that what we're doing is on track. I can add a little bit with that. Uh, if, if, For example, if you are from a council and if you, you in the next 10-15 years you probably will be uh, building new assets and when you are building those it's important to consider what those assets lifespan will be. So if you left asset, if you're building something in the next 10, 15 years, and the design life of those assets are 50 years, so any decision that you make next 50 years will stay beyond that. So it's important from this perspective. Another uh, perspective is uh, if you're maintaining your existing assets for within next 10 to 15 years, 
if your some of the your assets might be due for renew within that particular period of time. So what decision you make on that about the renewal, how you renew those assets will also be important. So that's why it's important to consider climate change within even within a short period of time. Great. Look, um, I think it's time for our audience to be able to go back to do their normal jobs. Um, and we've taken up all their time. Look, thank you all very much for participating with us on this um, webinar. I hope you've got something useful out of it and, uh, and enjoyed it. Um, we will be putting the videos up onto our Facebook and YouTube sites um, within a couple of weeks. And we'd encourage you to share these with your colleagues who might not have been here today or, who, or even watch them again yourselves if you think you might get something um, out of them again. Um, Coast Adapt is there. It will be supported going forward over the next few years. So it's a resource that you can trust and we do encourage you to go in and use it um, and get back to us through the NCAF email address if you have any um, questions and challenges that you would like um, to, to know more about. So we appreciate your time this afternoon. Um, thanks very much to Fahim and Anne for their input. Um, and um, yeah, thank you all very much. <laughs>